Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Cor Kilstrom, Chief Technology Officer at Concordia, a layer one proof of stake blockchain with an integrated counterparty identification functionality. One of whose founders is Lars Seyer Christensen, co-founder and until 2016, co-CEO of Saxo Bank. Cor, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, I've mentioned one of the founders, but what is the history of uh, of Concordium? The strategy, are you Danish? Are you Swiss? Are you something in the middle? It's a very good question. Um, so uh, back in 2016, when Lars had uh, ended his Saxo Bank uh, adventure, he was uh, he was starting to look at, at what sort of the next uh, next thing for him. And um, he, uh, he eyed blockchain, but he also had this, uh, when he looked at it, he was like, this is fine, but but uh, this is also a completely unregulated market, right? This is a new thing that's coming up, and it completely transcends everything that's going on. Um, and obviously, uh, this this is not going to last, right? At some point in time, uh, regulation is going to take a look at, at blockchains, and and something uh, will have to give. So he felt that it was a super interesting space to go into, and he kind of wanted to uh, potentially even make his own blockchain. So how to go about that? Um, how do you build a blockchain? Well, what you do is, and, and, and build a, a, a blockchain that's, that's good and safe, by the way, right? What you do is you call some people who know crypto. And um, it so happens that at the University of Aarhus uh, here in, in Denmark, where I am, there is a, a group of cryptologists at the university um, who, uh, who know a lot about uh, crypto. And actually some of them came up with some of the foundations for, for cryptography uh, as well, uh, hash functions and, and other things that are like key to blockchain, right? That was actually invented here. So he called them up and he said, I want to build a blockchain. Can you help me? And that was sort of the beginning of a very fruitful collaboration with uh, that department over there. So um, Concordium founded, co-founded a, a group called Cobra, Concordium Blockchain Research Aarhus University with the crypto group over there. And, and over the years since 2017 and up until now, uh, we've been collaborating with Cobra to design the science behind the blockchain, basically. And, and we've sort of published, I think, around 70 plus white papers at this point that detail all kinds of aspects of building a blockchain, which has then since been turned into the Concordium product. So that's really the, the, the story of how we began. Um, the company is in um, is, a, is a Swiss entity, but in so many ways, it's also a, a Danish entity. I'm in Denmark, many of the engineers are here. We also have engineers in, in Zurich. Um, and so Lars is Danish, but he lives in Zurich. And, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a Danish Swiss company in that sense, but we are um, a Swiss entity. Now your own background isn't actually in blockchain. So what's the, A, what attracted you to this project and, and what experience and insight do you actually bring to building this layer one blockchain? Yeah, I have a master's degree in computer science from the same university actually, uh, but it's somewhat dated, 24 years uh, ago is when I took it. Um, and since then I've just been, been working in Denmark in the United States and in, in various small startups, had my own company. Eventually, back in 2014, I got a chance to work at Uber at a time when the company was only some 400 people. Um, so I was on a growth journey with, with Uber from 2014 to 2020, where the, the company literally grew from those 400 people to 27,000. And, uh, and the, the reach of the company grew from being just the United States, I think Paris and Stockholm to pretty much the whole world, right? So it was a tremendous journey uh, for me in terms of, of learning to work in a hyper growth uh, environment, how to build scalable software. Um, eventually, I was managing the storage team at Uber, and and once I finished that, I moved on to a company called um, Cloud Kitchens, which is uh, Travis Kalanick's newest uh, company. So I was managing storage, compute, network, and site reliability engineering at that company um, for almost two years until uh, Lars and um, my uh, CEO Lona called us, called me up, and and asked if I wanted to come on board as as the CTO of Concordium. My, my learning from both uh, Uber and, uh, and Cloud Kitchens is really about how to, how to build high performance teams, how to build scalable software, how to make sure that you build something that runs 24 seven, 365 and uh, how you productionize something. And I think that set of experiences is something that's relevant for any kind of product that you build. And in particular, also blockchain. Right? You, this, is a, this is an operation we will never take down. We don't have service windows. We don't basically shut the, the blockchain down to just you know service it, right? And it cannot 
um, we cannot be in a situation where the blockchain crashes. It's simply not an option. So um, bringing all of that and my experience in, 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 um, in scaling teams and building them out, I think is, is key to, to my job here. So you bring the experience of riding a rocket ship and making sure it doesn't crash. But as you stated at the outset, uh, the organization is still working very closely with, with people at the universities. Uh, what's the advantage of working with, um, with university uh, employees as opposed to people who've had experience akin to your own? I think you kind of need both. Um, if you look at this, the blockchain space, a lot of the projects out there um, are actually what you call tinkering projects, right? Someone decides that, hey, a blockchain is probably cool. Let me go down to my basement and tinker a little bit with it, or let me clone Ethereum and set my own thing up. Um, best case, you get something that works and um, you might even get something that gets traction and you might even sell a lot of tokens. You might even get rich and then the blockchain crashes or, or your stable coin isn't as stable as you thought it was because you've been doing something in the background. There are many, there are many examples of this. And um, if you build on science, which is what we've done, you have a much, much better chance of building something that will actually be robust, secure, safe, and and, and can actually um, fulfill the promise of a blockchain. But making it such that it's scalable um, is a whole different ballgame, right? Making it such that you can, you can just um, basically handle potentially any number of accounts, any number of requests, uh, that you can scale beyond the, the sort of the basis foundations and, and get to like high transactions is, is a whole different thing. So for that, you need different kinds of experiences, but it's also a blockchain world and it's also crypto. So you need, you know, you need basically both worlds in order to make this happen. I think that's, um, so that's what I can add uh, to what we already have. We have a, a ton of smart people involved uh, that know everything about crypto. And I come from a world where it's about really meeting the market, scaling fast, building out, never being down. Um, and I think that's a that's a great combination. Now, one of the things that uh, really caught my eye about Concordium is this integrated uh, digital identity functionality. And I think I know why. I think I know why it's important to have my view on that. But why do you think that is important to the success of a layer one blockchain? Yeah, so, um, so that's actually the unique uh, property that we have in Concordium. It's um, in order to even open an account in Concordium, you have to go through this identity verification process. And um, it's, you know, you take a, a picture of your passport, uh, you do a selfie as part of the process. And then um, there is a system in the background that, uh, that does a check, that checks the passport um, looks right. And that the, um, your picture looks like the one on the passport. And then we can issue a digital ID. This is done by external identity providers. So it's not like Concordium does it, but these are partners that we uh, integrate with. Uh, once the ID is there, it's in your wallet. Uh, and every time you do a transaction, you move um, our native coin, the CCD, or you buy or sell something, that transaction will be recorded on the blockchain. And there'll be a reference, um, an encrypted reference to um, a pseudonym um, that basically identifies you, right? That pseudonym uh, is then used as a key over at the identity issue. And, and if you have it, you can, you can unlock it. But in order to do that, you would need some keys. And those keys we have put with um, some law firms that are that we call um, anonymity revokers. So not a single person can actually do this. This is something that can only be done by, um, by everyone involved. And so if law enforcement comes knocking, we can point them to the anonymity rule because they can then resolve it. I think this is, this is actually what we believe is key to creating a, a platform upon which you can build applications that comply with the regulation. Um, there are so many examples of, of, of things going on in, in Europe and the United States right now in terms of trying to figure out how to deal with uh, AML problems, um, counter-terrorist financing, um, there's a Mika Act. Uh, the SEC in the USA is is look, has, has even created a uh, task force to deal with blockchain um, and figure out how to handle this. Um, there's the EU six directive on on AML FCTF, and and so we believe that we uh, we in the coming years we will see uh, the established uh, world of finance and the established world of government come to the world of blockchain and say, you know, it's great what you're doing, but you need to start playing ball. Right, you need to start allowing for regulation to come in and and deal with what's going on here, and for that an ID is key, right? So if you can if you can resolve who actually did something, then 
you know you can find out who did it and and potentially wouldn't need um, other companies to go and analyze the blockchain and find out maybe it's some person or someone else. So it was really the the imposition of the FATF recommendations on um, customer due diligence, if you like, back in 2018, which which drove you to incorporate this feature. It's interesting. I, I was looking at a FATF survey of progress on the implementation of uh, of AML CTF in uh, in I don't know it was a, dozens of jurisdictions around the world, and hardly anybody, hardly any country, had actually made any serious progress on it. And there we are, you know, almost exactly four years after that was was laid on the industry. So, um, and I and I sense as you've indicated, the regulators are getting a bit uh, antsy about that, and so. It probably will be a, a, a tremendous sales feature for you as you as you go forward. But can I tease out a little bit what those um, those partners you work with? You, you're working with a bunch of digital ID vendors. You're also working with these these law firms, which I think you call anonymity revokers. Um, can you explain a little bit a little bit more detail how what each of those partners actually bring to the to the party? Presumably, the the, the, the vendors bring that photographic passport component, uh, but the lawyers are fulfilling some slightly more important role. They're revoking yeah. people's anonymity, presumably. Yeah, uh, to some extent, right? So so the the important thing to understand is that we sort of split the, the knowledge of figuring out who was doing the transaction between multiple parties. So not a single party can go and, and, and figure it out. The anonymity revokers are really law firms, um, and we've given the law firms a ledger with a key on it and that they keep in custody. Um, they cannot use that key individually. Um, if they, um, if the other keys are brought together, then the combined set of keys can unlock any transaction on Concordium. And what that would reveal is a um, is a pseudonym which doesn't say anything about the person behind it. It's just basically a random string, plus the identity issue or that issued the ID uh, that corresponds to that particular pseudonym. Now, with, with that in hand, you can now go to that identity issue and say, tell me uh, this particular key here, this string, who is behind that? And then the identity issue can go ahead and look up uh, the, the string and then find the ID information because they're storing it. Um, the identity issue cannot use the, the, the pseudonym for anything. They have the database of pseudonyms to ID, but they can't really use that because they cannot decrypt the, um, the pseudonym on the blockchain. Right. So, so that's really the, the way we sort of divide this. Is it perfect? Not really. Uh, we want to make this much more decentralized. We are looking to do multi-party computation on, on the keys and, and basically um, abstracting it away from, from single entities. And the same thing can be done for IDs and other things. So we are, we are only at the very beginning of how this should work. And this is a very centralized way of doing it to some extent. It's still, you know, in a way where not a single party can resolve it. Um, but we're looking to improve on this particular aspect of the chain. Mm. I'll ask you about your views on digital identity in general in just a second, but just on a couple of points of, of detail. Um, can people choose their own law firm? Can they choose their own digital ID vendor? Uh, uh, or do they have yeah. to work with yours? <laughs> right now, uh, in terms of the ID vendors, these are external companies, obviously, that, that do KYC for, for other um, customers than us. We have just signed up with two, and we are looking to make an infrastructure where it's easy to onboard any number of identity issuers that live up to certain standards. So at this point, you have to choose between the two we have signed up with. Um, like, again, I said, it's not, it's not perfect, and um, it's a thing that will definitely be evolved as we go forward. Um, in, in, in 2023 on our roadmap is the ability to open up for any number of identity issuers and even not just those that look at the legal identifier, but also potentially companies issuing, you know, uh, employment IDs or your local chess club uh, issuing you a card there or loyalty cards or other things, which will then be able to keep in your wallet and use in applications. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed with all of this. And it'll, that means we'll have to do an evolution on the whole identity issue or life cycle onboarding and, and, and other things. Does that strategy include issuing identities to corporates as well? You've mentioned, you know. Yes. Yeah. It, so it, a company can get one of these, can get yeah. checked, if you like. Yes, it absolutely does. Uh, the, the thing about companies is that we, we have this uh, database uh, called the LEI database, where you keep, uh, you know, information about European um, 
companies, that's a good starting point for onboarding something like this. And that's what we're looking to do uh, so that you can basically onboard European companies and you can issue a company um, identity, which would then be be sort of the, st the, the starting point for bootstrapping issuing identities within the company. So you can imagine, um, I mean, you could, you could sign up uh, as future finance administrator by proving that you have the, um, the the nationally issued company ID somehow, right? We need to figure out the details, but that if you could do that, well, then you could start issuing uh, company IDs uh, or employment IDs to your employees, uh, which can then be used in applications um, on the blockchain, like proving that you are working for uh, future finance or for Concordium might give you some benefits with some partner that we might have like the 10% discount in the bookstore, or it could even allow you to vote on certain things within the company, or, you know, you can come up with so many different things that that could be used for. So, so that's, that's the direction we're headed. Um, and, and we're planning to, uh, to do the evolution on all of that in, uh, in early 2023. As far as I'm concerned, it can't happen fast enough. Every time I'm asked to prove my identity as myself or prove the identity of my company, I ask myself the question, why aren't uh, digital identities wildly popular and being implemented everywhere? Do you no, think, do you I, think that, that, that one day they're, they're going to be, that, that digital IDs are, are going to be widely adopted at some point in the future, the near future? Yes, uh, I, I, I think that will happen. I think there's also a lot of resistance in the market, but I, I think you know it, the way this should be approached, and that's, that's always how you win it, is to make sure that there are like really great reasons for people to do this. They really want to do it, right? Um, so they, they they couldn't even avoid doing it because the benefits of doing it are just so great. Uh, so um, if, for instance, here in the in the fall, we are going to be rolling out a new version of Concordium where you'll be able to use your, your ID, the one that you already have, in the de de decentralized application. So my application could ask you, um, you know, are you older than 18 before you go ahead and... Uh, and um, and go into my online gambling uh, shop, for instance, right, or my casino, um, because I'm I'm required to do that by law. And using the our wallet, you'll be able to provide a zero knowledge proof that will actually allow me to determine that you are indeed older than 18 and you hold an English passport. It was verified by this issuer. And if I trust that, then I'll let you in, right? That opens up for so many use cases. And and um, if you have uh, you know casinos starting to require this, because first of all, there will be the forcing function of the the regulation and then the other side of it is of course the the convenience of just having to identify yourself once and you can control who you give what information to and you won't be giving your birth date and your name and other things that you really don't want to give to the casino you're just giving away yes i am older than 18 right um but not how much older just enough to to know that you can actually get in so i think if you can create that and if you can if you can create sort of a an infrastructure where it becomes super convenient um to use the id then it'll then you know the catch will come out of the bottle but that's what we're we're still pushing for right getting to the point where this actually happens so i don't know how long it'll take dominic but it'll, it'll, it'll happen when you reach that point do you envisage yourselves as concordium in effect doing that work on behalf of the consumer or the corporate in other words owning and controlling and releasing managing the data or do you think that consumers and companies are going to want to own and manage and control their data themselves so I think the service that, you're going to provide or something no, like self-serve? I, I think the latter, actually. What we're planning to do is we're planning to build an open infrastructure where you can onboard identity issuers that can then issue whatever. Um, and then it all, it all boils down to trust. How, how, how can you trust the issuer, right? So we have to, to get the infrastructure ready for that. Um, and then uh, using the wallet, uh, you have basically a metaphor where you can keep all of these identity attributes at hand and, and ready to use yourself whenever you feel like it, right? So instead of being in a situation where you have signed up for, let's say, a Facebook login or something like that, where you gave them a lot of information and now the Facebook login button is all over the place, which is great for convenience and probably also great for security. They have two-factor authentication, other good things. Um, but it's not so great for, for your privacy because Facebook will be collecting information about what sites you're accessing and potentially also use tracking cookies. And for Google, it's probably even worse, right? They also have calendars and Gmail and other things. And so your privacy is really gone. But in this, in this space here, you can actually have much more control over your privacy because now you own it. And if you, if you fast forward into the future, you can imagine things like electronic health records and other things you can choose selectively to give, give information away to to select practitioners. Who may not need to know everything about your medical history, but just enough about your blood pressure to treat you for 
some uh, ailment that you have, right? And and that's where I, where I think they should be headed, yeah, like self-sovereign control, decentralized and completely uh, not controlled by a single entity. And, and that's also what we are aiming for. We're not we're not aiming to be a central uh, central body that does everything. Okay, so you're going to make it uh, easy for providers of those services, if you like. Now, the other, you are a, 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 a you know a layer one blockchain. Um, I wonder how you have dealt with the other issue, which always comes up uh, with blockchain, which is the question of speed uh, and of scalability. I saw that you're claiming a speed of of 12 seconds to, to finalization and yes. speed and scalability are, are kind of facets of the same thing. Um, how have you overcome the speed and scalability shortcomings of blockchain? Right. So this the the finalization protocol that we have implemented is is um, is a result of the collaboration with Cobra at the at the Ocean University, and it's it's basically a finalization protocol where um, our finalization is run by a subset of the bakers uh, that are the nodes that create the the next CCD coin. Right. So these are specialized nodes running uh, on the network. In order for the for our finalization to work, we actually have our protocol actually uh, um, requires that we have around two thirds of honest bakers running. And um, once we have that, then um, um, we, can, we, can with guarantee, we can guarantee the finalization within this, uh, this time. So I would say that it comes down to the actual protocol that we've implemented, uh, which, is, which is based on, on this subset of finalizers that, that really easily come to consensus on, on what it is they want to finalize, and then they just simply write it. And this might be a, a stupid question, which, which you've already given the answer, but is the solution you have found um, to the speed and scalability problem actually unique to you? you? You're obviously working with this other party, but is it just a variant of the sharding and the side chains which we, which we read about as solutions, or is it something completely new? Well, back in 2017, uh, when we came up with this, it was completely new. <laughs> I would say that these days, uh, others have also implemented fast finalization. We're not the only ones having this. And then, of course, uh, solutions like side chains um, with, um, with roll-ups and, and other things have popped up as ways to improve on the speed for some of the, the other blockchains. Ethereum, for instance, has, has this. There's also sharding that others claim to implement more or less, right? Um, we are currently uh, actually in in um, we're sort of doing the maintenance on our on our finalization layer now to and our, actually not our finalization but on our our consensus layer in order to to increase the speed of that because in parallel while we've been researching at the University of Oslo, so also have others there are a lot of there's a lot of research that's gone into this particular space and um, and of course we'll be leveraging that right so we are we are looking to actually um, implement a variant of the, it's called hot stuff consensus protocol. So a variant of that is what we're going to augment the existing consensus protocol with, and we're expecting to get a speed up of, of two to three X based on that, but it's still TBD exactly what that will yield. And then there's sharding, which is also really a scalability thing, right? So the consensus protocol update, which is coming um, in the fall of this year, uh, is sort of the precursor to us doing real sharding. So we are currently designing the actual sharding solution and figuring out how that will work. And, um, and I can say to you that doing sharding the, the, the real way, doing it right and doing it in a way where you can scale out and you can reshard and you can figure out how to distribute your accounts and your smart contracts across multiple small chains, it's not trivial at all. So um, the aim for us is to be ready with the, uh, the design uh, around Christmas and then starting the implementation in Q1 of 2024 with this, an explicit aim to be able to scale out, right? Um, of course, scalability is, an, is a function of success as well. So at this time, uh, we can still uh, comfortably live with the, uh, with the 400 TPS uh, that we guarantee on the chain. We have also seen upwards of a thousand, but 400 is what we guarantee. Um, this, but you know, as we go forward and and um, and we'll see more transactions, then obviously uh, this is something that's necessary. So that's that's our strategy right now. Now, something else which uh, caught my eye about Concordium is that you are open, you're public, you're permissionless. Does that mean that you are happy not to work with institutions? I mean, it sounds like you're working with with quite a few anyway. Or does it mean that you? feel that you can provide institutions with an open public permissionless network, which will meet their concerns? Uh, yes, um, I think, um, I mean, 
the, the the public blockchain is basically a place where you can put information and show to others that um, you know there's non-repudiation involved in a blockchain, right? Once it's written, you cannot dispute that this particular set of bytes uh, was as they were at that given time, right? So that's great for signatures and documents and, and other things. And so there are certain use cases um, where uh, any type of business can actually benefit from using a blockchain in typically in the sort of interface between their customers or their partners where trust is is somewhat uh, of an issue, right? So if you can if you can use a blockchain run by a decentralized body of 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 um, of people and companies to prove certain things about a transaction or who you are that something happened, then yes, um, then that's 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 an obvious right. And if you don't trust big corporation as a consumer, for instance, you may trust when the big uh, the big company writes something on the blockchain for you that this was actually what happened, or that you know you transferred a deed or something between X Y Z, and and it, it actually sits there on the blockchain now for for everyone to see. So I believe yes, um, I think that's. Um, it's, it doesn't preclude us from working with institutions. On the contrary, I think there are lots of use cases where this can be used. You've also chosen a, a proof of stake model. Now, proof of stake models have acquired a, a reputation for having what might be called governance problems. Uh, how are you managing those in your proof of stake model? It's a very good question. And, and, and another one where this whole aspect of, of running a decentralized blockchain comes into play uh, we've touched on it, right? Like everything you do when you run a public permissionless blockchain essentially has to be uh, decentralized. And um, I mean, you start out, whenever you start something, you always start out with a centralized body. Some people coming together, working on something, publishing, you make, it, make a company and then you start it up. And the same thing is true for Concordium. Um, we have a blockchain right now, um, which is decentralized, but there are some centralized aspects that we are looking to decentralize. And one of them is the governance aspect. Uh, right now, there is a governance um, committee that 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 meets every so often to to decide on changes to tokenomics, on changes to um, to to key operational aspects of the blockchain, and also potentially what sort of next. Right, um, we're looking to divide to divide those two things. So we're looking to have a, an organization that builds the blockchain and evolves it, but which is actually being operated or paid by um, by by the Concordium blockchain, which is then uh, governed by a decentrally um, elected set of people or by way of direct democracy. Now, figuring out how to do this is, is almost like creating a new country and deciding what governance uh, you want there and uh, what type of government do you want, right? And, and so we've partnered with the University of ETH in Zurich. Uh, so I mentioned I have scientists sitting in Zurich and they are collaborating uh, closely with ETH as well, where we also have um, a great uh, set of scientists, both within tokenomics, um, within finance, but also within crypto that can help us out with this. Um, specifically, we're working with uh, Professor Hans Gerschbach and his group um, at, at the university to, to, to figure out what, what, should the, what should basically the government model be. Should we, should we base it on who has an account already, who has a certain amount of CCD staked uh, on the blockchain, um, or know what are the what are the functions that we want? Do we want direct democracy for some decisions? How do you even know what to vote for, right? As a as a person who can vote, and um, and then how do we make sure that that you know we don't create an an infrastructure that can that can be used negatively for a hostile takeover, which can then you know bring down the chain potentially, right? There's like so many things to figure out, but the 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 intent is to have a a relatively fast working group that will have the essentials of this worked out in early 2024 so that we can start implementing a DAO and uh, start looking at doing elections in 2024 on, on small things, right? And then potentially elect a person from the outside in as one of the first things and then start you know, making votes about smaller things. And then as we progress over the years, we will gradually decentralized Concordium's governance body even more. But we are very wary that this has to happen slowly and you cannot force it because you might easily make a mistake, right? That that brings down everything. So it's super dangerous and not, not trivial. I can see that your DAO, your decentralized autonomous organization is, is still at least 18 months away. But, and I don't know whether your, your friends at universities have been able to decide how a DAO fits inside existing laws in either Denmark or or Switzerland, 
uh, it's a live discussion here in the UK, you know, is it a, is it a partnership? Is it a company? Is it a cooperative? What is it? Uh, in the US, they seem to, in certain jurisdictions, have decided it's a cooperative. Um, but looking forward to when you have this in place in, uh, in say, 2024, do you think that DAOs are going to mature to become a genuine alternative to the corporate structures we have today, by which I mean limited liability companies and um, limited or unlimited liability partnerships? Those are the two basic structures, plus, right. I guess, a cooperative. Do you think they provide a long-term alternative? I think it's a very interesting question. It also, sh I mean, the, the fact that we're even talking about it kind of shows the, the typical scenario that, that technology is pushing the boundaries of law and, and regulation. Um, a, a, a DAO is, I guess, conceptually similar to an LSC. Right? There's no leading member of the organization that has a majority rule. So in this case, you can set up a DAO that does the same thing. Um, in, in a DAO, uh, the whole thing is, is sort of modeled on a decentralized cryptocurrency and, and it operates without any human interventions. It's all just a set of smart contracts that clicks on the chain. Um, and and by, by that, you can, you can do all of your, um, your governance. Um, now, I think we can all agree that we could implement this and uh, we can test the smart contracts, make them safe and secure and, and convince ourselves that this would actually work and we can even get it up and running. But getting from there to getting countries and um and and uh and the, the legislation in place for this to be recognized as an llc or something like that i think there's a, there's a ways to go there and i think we have to approach this piecemeal and there has to be legislation works slowly just like we should with the governance right and figuring it out to do it right and i think it's not actually necessarily a bad thing it works slowly here because again it's 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 a tricky thing to get right we've spent a lot of time in in outside of the blockchain world over the many many um, years that that companies have existed to get this structure right and then getting it into a new world um, is something that has to be done in the right way but i think yes potentially yes it has it has the potential to to become such a thing uh in the future talking of cryptocurrency uh concordium has also issued a native coin of its own onto i think six cryptocurrency uh exchanges now is that coin use primarily to pay the stakeholders for the work that they're doing in your proof of work model? Or does it have a wider role to play, like such as settling transactions uh, on the blockchain network? Yeah, so that, that's the that's the interesting thing about a decentralized um, blockchain, like a, a public permissionless blockchain like ours, is that uh, in order to incentivize anyone to run the nodes, I mean, what would, what would incentivize you to download my software and you know, turn on your computer, install it, and have your computer running 24-7, 365, and, and consuming power. Well, um, not much unless you may, uh, unless you were, you know, uh, did it for uh, altruistic reasons uh, or because you were um, incentivized otherwise, right? So in order for that to happen, is uh, you have to have a currency on the blockchain. So that's really, that's really the basics of, of why there is a currency. And now in a proof-of-stake blockchain, um, we have the uh, miners or the bakers, as they're calling Concordium, which are these specialized nodes that that have a chance um, every so often to create a new CCD. Um, and that new CCD uh, will then be uh, be part of the reward, uh, and they will they will help do the uh, infrastructure of the blockchain and and do the consensus and do the finalization to make sure that all the transactions are written. And in return, they get the CCD. So. Um, that's really the basics and you can have the, the blockchain running and clicking there. If it weren't for the fact that in every time you do a transaction on the blockchain, uh, there's a small fee involved as well, right? If you do Ethereum, you, you're looking at gas fees in order to do a transfer between accounts or if you wanna do anything. Um, so for you to do anything uh, on it, you'll have to go and get some CCDs basically in order to, to, to do transactions. So I would say that the, the CCD is the foundation for kicking off a whole, um, like wide array of applications, the whole decentralized finance space starts with this and the fact that there is a coin. Um, there are things, basic things like you, you now have your CCDs on the chain and you want to, to counter that there is a, um, there's an inflation on the chain. We have an inflation, obviously, because every time, you know, a small amount of time has passed, a new CCD is minted. That means all of the other CCDs, they just slowly decrease in value for every, every single CCD that's minted. That inflation you want to count on, how do you do that? Well, if you could put them somewhere where you could make a, uh, a buck, well, wouldn't that be great? And that's why we have staking, right? So 
as a as a person, you can you can then maybe have a, let's say you have a thousand CCDs in your wallet. If you just let them sit there, they depreciate over time. But if you decide to help participate in the blockchain by putting your stake within a baker, you can do that on Concordia. You just basically stake directly from your wallet. You can make an interest, right? And then uh, you can make um, you can basically Im improve on on your wealth and, and counter the uh, the inflation. And then of course. That's just the primitives, right? And it, it opens up for lending protocols, decentralized lending. I can I can lend you money, uh, and you can borrow from me um, without an intermediary such as a bank. And if you have like the ID layer that we have, I might be inclined to also want to know your name and and uh, a little more about you, right? And you can even prove to me that you might even in the future be able to prove your address as well if I want that, right? So that way we can establish a, a more firm foundation of trust and I can I can now start doing transactions with you directly without having a bank. And so all of that again opens up for things like gaming and and uh, metaverse where money and, and currencies is also going to be a thing um, or is already a thing. Uh, so. So yeah, I would say that um, there's so much to say about it, right? But it, it's sort of the foundation of a proof of stake or even any blockchain, also proof of work blockchains, that you have this currency. And as a side effect, you can build all of this interesting stuff. Now, a question about bridges. Concordium has built bridges to other blockchain networks for the obvious reason that interoperating with other networks is, is good for every network. It uh, creates liquidity and so on. But those bridges have acquired a reputation for creating points of vulnerability. How do you make sure the bridges you're building are secure? It's a, <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, so yes, uh, we, we have a bridge uh, which is going to be launched very, 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 very soon. We actually don't have a bridge at this time, but we will be launching uh, a bridge called Cornucopia, like a horn of plenty, because we're hoping that a lot of coins will, will, be, will be exchanged over that bridge. Um, the launch date is, is, uh, is not set yet, but it's, it's likely within a few weeks. It's already built and, and, uh, and tested. Um, in order to verify that the bridge actually works, we are doing quite a few things. So we are, uh, what everyone does is they work with some external auditor that has a long checklist of things to look for in the smart contracts. And in particular, the smart contracts on the two chains that the bridge operates between have to be verified intensely. Is that a not enough? Uh, is that enough to, to make sure that you don't have problems? It's not, right? There are many examples of bridges that have been, um, compromised, you know, someone was able to mint a wrapped version of a coin without actually putting the real coin in on the other side. And then after that, they could sell the whole thing back to the bridge and get it deplete the bridge from for, for ether or something like that, right? And then bring the whole thing down. Um, so we do that. But we also work again with the University of Aarhus. There is a, a research group over there that does exactly this. They're working on smart contracts and formal verification of smart contracts. And, uh, and we're currently formalizing how we will be be utilizing what they have already and how we can evolve uh, formal analysis of smart contract code in order to make sure that what's going on here is actually really the real deal, right? And that that there are as few bugs as possible. Um, I will not sit here and guarantee that that means that in the future there will be no bugs in our smart contracts because there are always bugs in code. And there might also in the future, um, fingers crossed that it won't happen, but there might of course also be a situation where we uh, we have smart contracts that are compromised. I'm, I'm hoping we can avoid that, but um, I also know from <laughs> from experience that 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 box and software. So um, these are these are basically the ways, right? So manual review, uh, analysis of the code, uh, using tools, and then formal analysis. And as this is a research field, which is fairly young still, I'm expecting lots of things to happen there. As you narrow down the scope of what you can express in this in the smart contract to just the right things. You can also create uh, more formal verification methods that can check for all kinds of, of strange vulnerabilities in the code. Now, I sh probably should have asked you this earlier, but it's a question about zero knowledge proofs, which crudely speaking, I understand to be using hashes to prove authenticity without sharing confidential information. What, what uses, what value have you found for, for zero knowledge proofs in your work? Um, yeah, so zero knowledge proofs are actually used for uh, quite a few things already in, in Concordium. So during the ID registration, um, we use it to show that the, the user knows the, the relevant secret values and and um, and form the data there correctly. Um, when you open an account, we use it to show that the user has a valid ID and that it's correctly attached to, to the account. Um, we're also currently rolling out, or it's going to be rolled out in, um, in, in, in the fall here, 
the ability to recover an ID from an identity provider, there you have to re-authenticate with the identity provider and prove that you are you, and then you can recover your um, ID. Um, and then we have a feature called uh, shielded balances where you can basically hide the amount of, of um, CCDs that were transferred in a transaction so that it's, it's, um, it's not shown on chain for everyone's eyes, but only between the two parties that were interacting in the transaction. This is also using zero knowledge proofs. And then when we release the new version of uh, the ID in uh, the ID 2.0 in the fall, it'll be used also for me to prove to you that I'm older than 18 or from Denmark or, or something, something. And now we can start building applications around it, which is a, a, a very cool application. Uh, use cases, uh, you, you've touched on these once or twice in this, um, in this conversation. When I go to your website, I, 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 I see a list of use cases you've identified as, as your primary targets, if you like, for this Concordium blockchain. And I'll, I'll, I'll list them for you. They're tokenization, um, automated market making in DeFi protocols, uh, decentralized exchanges, borrowing, lending, and so on. Third one is, um, less surprisingly, uh, digital ID. Uh, there's supply chain traceability and settlement. Uh, there's insurance contracts. There's also GameFi. Now, I don't know whether you can give a single separate reason for why each of those has been identified as a, as a use case, but what does that list tell us about where you see the opportunities lying for your particular blockchain um, uh network? It's yeah. Um, so so um, I wish we had published the, our new website. We have a new website. It, it is ready to be published, and it will be out again in a few weeks. Um, on that website, you will be able to see uh, a slightly different message. But everything you mentioned here is still relevant, and so we we'll, we'll, we are definitely also looking at all of these things. I think at the, at the foundation of Concordium is the idea, as I mentioned, and we look uh, through all of these other things through um, through that lens. Tokenization, of course, is, is what has been sort of a very, very successful use case for many blockchains over the past couple of years, two or three years. We've seen Dogecoins and, and uh, Bored Apes and, and other things pop up that have gained massive value and that people have been exchanging. And, um, and now we're sort of looking at tokenizing the real world, right? Tokenizing cars and car ownership and those things. And of course, we want to be able to uh, make it super easy to build these kind of applications on Concordium like make it easy to make a non-fungible token about something uh, to, um, to use uh, Concordium to, to pin IoT devices in the real world. And, I, and again, our ID infrastructure can be used to identify devices as well, which is the thing we're looking at as well. How can we tie that in with real world devices that you then can prove ownership of and, and, and other things? Um, and then, of course, other things in terms of fungible tokens, and you provide a new kind of, of, um, of currency on the chain. Um, or even these uh, non-transferable, non-fungible tokens, also known as soulbound tokens, which is what we are going to be using to uh, control the life cycle of identity attributes on our chain, um, which should also be just like super easy. So, so for tokenization, it's really about lowering the bar, making it super easy to build these things, and then leveraging our ID to 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 be used where it makes sense. Right? Um, DeFi. I think we touched on that already. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think for DeFi, uh, some of the problems that have been tormenting this space, namely that, you, that it's been used for, for uh, money laundering or, or you know, illegal activities, we are hoping that the infrastructure that we bring to the table will actually help counter some of these problems. Um, and then, of course, also, like I said, lending, for instance, right? There are situations where you want to reveal more about yourself in order for the other party to gain trust. Uh, that this is actually a, a person I can I can rely on. Um, uh, KYC protocols. We're not doing KYC, by the way. We're doing identity verification. At a full fledged KYC would also require you do checks against various lists and and other things. But having having a KYC process where you can actually take your KYC information and use it in different settings. Today, most countries uh, require financial institutions that they do their own KYC. So every time you change a bank, you have to do your KYC again, which is, which of course is uh, annoying for the consumer. But imagine if you could, you could get to a point where you can actually, you can actually do the KYC once. And then because it's been through a process that everyone um, likes or uh, feels feel good about, 
then you might be able to to reuse that in certain settings and reveal certain aspects from that KYC process, which again yields some some identity attributes. And I think you know there are just so many things that you can do in DeFi. It it, it um, where the ID is relevant. So so that's a that's a key thing. And of course the ID, uh, which is the main thing we're we are pumping out right now as a feature. Um, uh, like I said, is is the thing. And then you mentioned supply chain traceability and settlement. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the moniker there is ESG. And uh, it is really about both uh, CO2 tracking, but also being environmentally responsible and, and socially responsible, um, and then tracking supply chain, right? So, so, so the whole thing about tracking um, carbon dioxide emissions and and proving to the world that you are actually environmentally friendly in your production of things is exactly where a blockchain fits very well, right? Because here you can now publish that at this point. Um, you know, I moved my goods by truck from A to B. This is exactly how, how much gas was used on this and that. Therefore, the CO2 emission was such and such. And therefore, the, the, the table that you're buying has had the CO2 fit footprint. Um, the, so, so I think those things, getting into that vertical is, is a space where things are happening. And that's why we're looking uh, to, to do that. Um, in terms of insurance and uh, insurance contracts, the... Blockchain has the ability to help automate claims functions like by verifying coverage between um, companies and uh, and reinsurers, but it can also automate payments between parties for claims and, and, and can help lower administrative costs for insurance companies. So I think insurance is another one. It's also a place where the ID plays a role. You can, and, and the potential also KYC plays a role, right? And you sign up for a new insurance provider. You also typically go through a long process of, of giving a lot of information about yourself. And imagine you could do that once you have self-sovereign control over it. You give exactly what they they want, or you choose not to give it um, because you don't want to give it away, and you go to another provider. And of course, games, metaverse, uh, that whole space there is huge, right? Um, you see that some of the we we are we are currently collaborating with quite a few game studios on on um, on building on Concordium, and this is both for things like in-game tokens, like an, an economy within the games. It's like assets where you, you have an asset within a game and imagine you could actually sell that and you could take it outside of the game or you could reuse it in another game, published maybe by the same provider. Now, all of a sudden, the, the, the asset takes a life of, of its own. It becomes an NFT. You can even showcase it on some websites or your uh, social media. Um, and then uh, things like uh, peace of mind for parents, right? The, the fact that this game is recommended for people older than 16 and, and your 11 year old wants to play it, you just turn on no, sorry, right? Um, not happening. Uh -huh. um, this, is a, this is a space where, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity. There are also things like chat chat rooms um, is, is, a, is a feature that's there in, in many online games and or even just voice chat, right? And then in, in real, you know, you're playing with this avatar and uh, the avatar is, becomes your friend and, and uh, you feel like you want to meet up in the real world. Uh, but how do you know that this person is actually uh, this um, this 15 year old girl that they claim they are? Uh, how do you know, right? Uh, and so, again, uh, the ID can come into play in order to prove that this is indeed true, and and uh, that you you should feel more comfortable about this person that you're talking to. Here. It's interesting and obviously very significant how central that digital identity piece is to so many of the use cases that you've just talked about. Yeah, I think it. I think also that's what we identified, right? Is it, once you start looking at it, there for all of these things, there is like this is a key aspect that can help prove provide trust and and confidence between the parties interacting, and and the fact that it, you know we allow you to selectively give away some information, not everything. Maybe just the fact that you're from England might be enough for me, right? Or the the fact that you are uh, older than. 21 might be enough for me, or the fact that you're not from North Korea or, or something, something um, that could be enough to establish the element of trust that I need in order to do business with you, um, or that you can give away your name. And, and I can actually know that, that, that your name is indeed Dominic, right? So. Uh, just before I let you go, some questions about where you've, where you've got to, how many clients are you working with? How many of you signed up? Um, so that's a that's a good question. I'd say that you know the um, we have a couple of of applications running on Concordium now. The, Con the Concordium mainnet was launched a year ago, and we started selling the CCD in February. So um, 
and we're now building out the infrastructure to really make uh, distributed applications that will come now, right? So we've sort of been going slowly also because of the science thing in it, but we do have a, uh, a couple of things. There is a naming service running on Concordium. There's um, the, uh, there is a, an NFT marketplace, uh, Space7 running on Concordium and a few other applications. We have quite a few that are coming. So we hit the pipeline is, is bigger. We have a grants program that is being used to fuel all kinds of applications. Um, I mentioned four games that we have signed up with. Uh, we have an energy provider. Um, we do already have a, um, a Japanese uh, party that's using Concordium for e-voting. We just um, started the collaboration on a tender with the government of Greenland, which will, uh, which is an interesting one. The, the, the government of Greenland is looking to do e-voting. And so over the next three years, we'll be evolving. How can you do e-voting on Concordium in collaboration with the University of Aarhus? And, and um, yeah, those are, those are some of the bigger ones that, that we have. But I mean, we don't have in the thousands at this time, but of course, as soon as the ID comes out, uh, I mean, I'm sure it'll explode, Dominic. <laughs> And in terms of uh, who you feel you're competing with? We are obviously competing with uh, with all of the other blockchains, but in, in reality, I think if you look at what the space is like, you can you can view it from two angles. One is that you want to be the next Ethereum killer, uh, or you do want to position yourself within an ecosystem of blockchains, or even within an ecosystem of IT, open IT running on the internet. And we are, we are do, looking to do the latter. Um, we we don't think that Concordium is going to blow blow um, Ethereum away. On the other hand, um, we think that there is there is ample room for a lot of chains out there with specialized capabilities. And we are looking to actually take the ID to a place where it can be used in white label solutions and where you can use it as a as an infrastructure if you want to attach an ID to some of the stuff you already have. So imagine um, you have a uh, a, a decentralized exchange or something running on uh, Ethereum and it, it uses Ether and, you, and that's, the, that's your thing. But now regulation is, uh, is, is knocking on your door and it you know, requires you to, to have some kind of way to identify your customers with, with safety. Wouldn't it be great if you could just plug in a, a little thing into your wallet and then boom, uh, you could go through the IDV process and, and all of a sudden you start transacting with, with identity and that identity was actually our identity that we provided as an infrastructure. So that's that's one of the um, the future directions that we are looking to to go. And um, and I think that will that will be great because then you know we are positioned as an identity solution to anyone else. But we also blockchain on which you can already build these applications. You don't have to build it anywhere else. You can just just build on us um, and get get both right. Uh, so we're not looking to blow everyone out of the water. We're looking to collaborate and actually provide a service for everyone. And I wonder what, what your investors are, are looking for. We talked at the outset about uh, Lars Sire Christensen. He's obviously a, a shrewd entrepreneur. He sees transformative potential in this technology, but he's not the only investor. You know, the company's raised $30 million, according to Crunchbase, from, from other investors as well. What do you think they saw in what Concordium is doing that they didn't see elsewhere? Yeah, we, we actually raised 50 million US dollars in private placement. Right. Okay, private placement is out of date, or I am anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's even better, right? So um, I think the investors that we have are here for the long haul. They believe that that uh, the world of blockchain will need the infrastructure that we are providing. They they also see the same picture that we do. They they realize that eventually regulation is, is going to be coming down hard on this whole space. And if you don't have an answer to to how do you do, do more uh, secure and safe transactions in terms of who you're dealing with on the blockchain, uh, then you're going to be in a, in a situation where you might not be able to continue to operate. So they're betting on, on, on this horse because they also feel that the uh, building an infrastructure around the ID is going to, to make it or break it in the future. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in, um, I'm in dialogue with many of our investors uh, at this time, and um, and and they uh, they're happy uh, with with the direction we're taking and uh, and are backing this up 100. percent So I feel like we are we are definitely headed in the right direction. Well, this is my last question. How will you know when you've succeeded? Do you have a picture in your mind of what success actually looks like, and when you get there, you'll be able to say we have succeeded. Success to me looks like. Uh, you know, games uh, where parents don't have to worry about what their kids are 
uh, um, who they're dealing with, a uh, metaverse where the same thing is true, finance where old money can come in with peace of mind and, and don't feel threatened about dealing with like scamsters or, or, or people that they can't control. Um, and then, of course, it looks like uh, lots of transactions going on on the Concordium blockchain, lots of activity, the chain growing, um, but first and foremost, customer success and customer happiness. I mean, if you take care of your customer, your business will take care of itself. Cool. Kilstrom, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to Future of Finance. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs>